Hi, good afternoon. My name is Miriam Goldberg. I'm a software engineer at Gigapan Systems. Uh, you're here for the talk on uh, stitching gigapixel panoramas. I hope everyone is in the right room for that. Uh, we're going to have three speakers, and the first of the three is Paul Heckford. He's been doing computer graphics and image processing since 1977. He holds degrees from MIT and UC Berkeley and was a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University in the 1990s. He currently works at Gigapan on the Stitch software. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so if you're in the back, feel free to move up. Um, <clears throat> it's nice to have the audience close. Um, so we've got uh, talks by um, talks about stitchers from different groups, different companies. Um, I'm going to talk about Gigapan Stitch. Um, so Gigapan Stitch is now commercial software, but it began its life as a research um, effort, primarily by Randy Bryant when he worked for NASA. Um, he continues to work for NASA, but he. Uh, Back around 2004, when the um, Spirit and Opportunity rovers landed on Mars, um, these, camera, th the, these robots uh, were equipped with uh, cameras f that um, were for scientific surveying and navigation on the planet. And at the top, you can see um, on the left and right sides at the very top of the mast, uh, there are two cameras called pan cams on the outside and two cameras called nav cams on the inside. The first having a longer f focal length and the latter having a shorter focal length, wider field of view. Um, these were used for taking photographs of the um, terrain around the, around the robot. And um, because of the constraints on sending vehicles to Mars, they're not built with you know, state-of-the-art technology. Um, they had only a one meg, even though this is only a few years ago, 2004, um, they had a one megapixel uh, camera in the pan cams. Um, there was no zoom capability, no focus, and in fact, no moving parts. The, the housing for the camera was milled out of a solid block of aluminum. So, you know, very reliable, but also, you know, pretty primitive by uh, 2004 standards and certainly by current standards. Um, but the scientists and all the people and the engineers um, working with the system, they needed to make do with what was available on Mars. It's a little hard to go up and modify the camera equipment once it's on Mars. Um, um, so Randy helped the people on the science and engineering teams visualize the the terrain around the robots uh, where they landed on Mars. Um, um, unlike some of the more commercial lower cost equipment, um, the pano head, which controls the panning and tilting of the camera, uh, was very precise and um, the images it shot had little overlap. There was little need for, for a great deal of overlap. When the cameras were, were set up and um, designed, they didn't really have the creation of panoramas in mind. They had in mind taking pictures of rocks and navigating to avoid running into rocks. Um, so the, the use of them for, for creation of panoramas was somewhat of an afterthought that Randy helped, <clears throat> helped uh, extract the best information and the best pictures out of, out of these uh, long focal length images that, that he could. Um, because the pano head was very precise, there little alignment was needed, and um, and it was good enough to just take the absolute information about um, pan and tilt of each image and use that as the absolute information and use that to do the alignment. <clears throat> and um, these were some of the initial images constructed uh, from those cameras. The top images come from the pan cameras, and the bottom images come from those nav cams. <clears throat> They're both pictures of the same scene, different sensitivities. And um, we're seeing the individual input images with their outlines shown in red there. Um, so once you've got a picture of the panorama, 
um, this system allowed people to zoom in and see the detail, you know, identify strata in the rock, which was hugely interesting to the scientists. Um, so moving on from there, Randy realized that, you know, here's a simple idea to take, take a camera, put it on a pan tilt head, and um, what if you could manufacture a pano head for relatively low cost and sell it to consumers? They could put their inexpensive um, point and shoot camera on it, you know, maybe sell this for a few hundred dollars. Um, you know, wouldn't that empower a lot of people? So the, that was the genesis of the idea for Gigapan. Um, the goals of the Stitcher software itself uh, were um, to work with a very simple pano head um, uh, that takes pictures in a basically a rectangular grid of panning and tilting. Um, we wanted something, we wanted the Stitcher to be able to handle thousands of images um, and not get bogged down in, align, in trying to do alignment of an arbitrary set of images. We're not supporting people taking pictures in a random order or in a random arrangement. Uh, the constraint that the images lie in a grid is very helpful in, as a first guess in the alignment. Um, we also wanted the stitcher to be very easy to use. So I'm going to um, go into a little bit of technical detail about um, how, how our algorithm works, uh, how the Gigapan stitch algorithm works. Um, so at a high level, there are four phases. First, the user picks uh, a grid of input images, identifying how many rows and columns there are, and sets up the adjacencies. So each image has four neighboring images in the grid. Then the next step is alignment, where we want to infer, you know, how was each input image aimed? Uh, what is the pan, the tilt, and the roll of each input image. Um, you know, we, we, know, we assume a priori that these images were shot with the Gigapan pano heads, so we assume that they're coming in like click, 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 something like that in, in some variations of that order. Um, we assume they're in a rectangular grid, but we want to solve exactly for the pan, tilt, and roll of each one. Um, you know, the mechanisms aren't exact. There's wind, there are people kick tripods. Um, there are a number of issues. Um, we also do, um, in the, uh, uh, the new version of Stitch that's coming out shortly, we do vignette correction. Um, and so to do that, we want to infer how much are the pictures darkened um, across each input image. Um, we look at the overlapping images to extract that information, as I'll describe in a minute. Um, finally, the final step is to blend all those images together. So we take each of these input images. Each of those is a perspective image. We want to reproject them basically onto a sphere. Um, that involves resampling the images into a different coordinate system. We do vignette correction on each one. We blend them all together. Um, so that the seams are as invisible as possible. Um, we build a quad tree from that, and I'll explain what that is. Um, and that, f that final quad tree is a day structure that can be uploaded, it can be viewed interactively, and that's our final stitched result. Okay, so let's talk about, um, talk about alignment. So in order to do alignment, most stitching algorithms, and well, in particular our stitching algorithm, looks for feature points. So, see, these are two pictures that overlap, right? So, you know, this fence is that fence, right? Um, so, you know, you can see that the bottom <coughs> of this tree and the bottom of that tree have been chosen as feature points. These points have been chosen as feature points. So feature points are like a distinctive image feature. It could be a dot. It could be a place where two things cross, like where this tree trunk crosses the line of the snow. Um, and they can be multicolored. Um, and we see that, you know, in this very schematic picture I've got here, there are four features common to between this picture on the left and this picture on the right. You know, there's a feature that's not present in the left image. There's a feature that's not present in the right image. Um, we automatically find these feature points. 
Uh, some images won't have any feature points at all. If you take a picture of the sky, there may be no features in it. Um, so what we're doing during alignment is solving for a number of variables. Um, there are global variables like the angle of view of each input image. Is it a narrow angle of view or is it a wide angle of view? Um, there could be radial distortion in the images, which is assumed to have a polynomial form, so solving for those ra um, radial poly polynomial coefficients. There are also parameters, um, since we're assuming things are coming in a grid, we assume that the delta pan between columns is nearly constant. We assume that the delta tilt between rows is nearly constant. And we assume that the role of each input image, I mean, it's probably close to zero, but we assume that they're all rolled about the same. Um, so those are like globals that are assumed. We're assuming that all input images have the same zoom, for example. Um, then for each input image, there are three primary variables, pan, tilt, and roll. So, you know, the first input image, what is its pan, what is its tilt, what is its roll, and then same thing for the next input image and so on. So you would get, you know, 3n plus, I don't know, 5 or whatever that is, 3n plus 5 unknowns for n input images. Um, then the alignment algorithm takes each of those input images finds the feature points, that, as I showed you a minute ago. Um, then first we do pairwise optimization where we take neighboring pairs. So if you've got this, this input image, you know, it's got a neighbor to its right, you would take the, that pair of images and find all the features in common and figure out the alignment of those two. And you do the same between this Im image and its neighbor below, and so on across the grid. Then. So that gives you like sort of a first guess of how each one is oriented relative to its neighbors. Then you do a global optimization where you take all of those degrees of freedom, all of those unknown variables and solve optimize to um, get the best fit overall um, to all the data you have. That can, that can be very slow. If you've ever done a very large stitch in GigaPan stitch um, over a thousand images say, you've probably noticed that the alignment is very slow, or well, gets very slow on huge numbers of images. Um, that's something we're working on, or we're hoping to optimize soon, but um, right now I'm not totally happy with, with how fast it is. Um, the next phase, an optional phase of stitching, is vignette correction. So vignetting is the phenomenon of the darkening of pictures around their periphery. On the top here we see the input images. These were shot by Bruce Perry. Um, um, you see how these input images are dark in their corners. I mean, I've plunked these down in right to left order, so this leftmost one is on top of the others. Um, you know, it's very dark in the upper right and lower left corner, certainly much darker than the one underneath it. Um, we'd like to correct that. Um, if you didn't do any special vignette correction at all, if you just assumed those pictures are fine and go ahead and run Stitch on them uh, with our current Stitch 1.0 <coughs> or past versions of Stitch, you would get this result. And maybe at first glance, you would say, oh, I don't know, that looks okay to me. But if you look a little more carefully, and particularly if I had a picture with more sky in it, you'd notice there's sort of a dark band here, dark here, dark here, dark there. And that's, that's coming from those dark edges and dark corners of the input images. Um, so there are ways to eliminate, uh, reduce vignetting um, by like choosing a different zoom, by choosing a smaller aperture, by increasing the overlap of your input images, but none of those really solve vignetting completely. So um, we wanted to find a way to infer the vignette attenuation and like really correct it. I mean, that, that would be the better goal. So way, uh, a, a little glimpse of the mathematics behind that is we assume that the vignetting is a function of radius. So if we call that radius zero and if we call this radius one here, we assume the attenuation function is some uh, quartic polynomial in radius 
And we want to solve for those coefficients C1 and C2. And we've got all these overlapping images. So, I mean, that gives us a lot of information. The overlapping images give us a lot of information. Um, I think we have a, a hair or something on the projector here. But if we know the alignment of these images, then we know that this point of the sky and that point of the sky are the same point in the world. Um, they should be the same color. Um, they're actually not the same color because they're a different radii and they're affected by different degrees of attenuation, a vignette attenuation. So what we can do is take all of the radii and luminances coming from pairs of images like that, treat that as a big collection of thousands, hundreds, tens or hundreds of thousands of point pairs and fit, try to fit a polynomial to that. So the dots are the data points and the thick line here is the quartic polynomial with the coefficients shown on the bottom that we fit to, the, to all those data points. So we've solved for the attenuation function. Um, so we're like, the light is not attenuated at all in the center, so it, the attenuation is one. And out here at radius one, which would correspond to the top and the bottom of the image, we're attenuating by 30% or so. So this is actually pretty significant attenuation in this example. Um, and here's what the results look like. Um, so the uncorrected image is on the top and the corrected one on the bottom. Um, so this is, these are the results from a new version of Stitch that um, we've got out for beta testing right now and we hope to release generally um, in a matter of weeks or maybe a month. Um, <clears throat> so I was pretty happy with these results. Um, I, I can't guarantee that it's perfect in all cases, but um, let's see, can, can most of you see the vignetting in that? Um, it's, I mean, there, there are more vivid cases than this. Um, sometimes if you print things, the, the gamma causes the vignetting to show up even more. So the uncorrected version has vertical bands that you may see. Um, the corrected version, I think, looks much better. And I've stared at this a lot. I'm going back and forth now between corrected, sorry, corrected, uncorrected, corrected, uncorrected, corrected, uncorrected. So I wouldn't claim that cor the corrected version there is perfect, but I think it's much improved. Um, so I need to finish, finish now, or finish shortly, but um, the final stage after vignette correction is to do blending. <clears throat> And um, this used to be the most costly part of the algorithm, um, but um, we're actually able to do it um, quite a bit faster recently. Um, so a, an important part of the Gigapan approach, you know, the way the web works and the way the stitcher works, is uh, the concept of an image quad tree, um, where you take your input image and you know, maybe you've shot a gigapan of an inauguration, let's say. Um, you might, um, when you're fully zoomed in, you might have that much detail in your images. You, t you divide up your input image into 256 by 256 pixel tiles. So that's, that's the size of that right there, it's 256 pixels on a side. And then you've diced it up into these tiles, and now a quad tree takes each takes uh, two by two blocks of, of tiles and averages them together to create a new 256 by 256 tile that's lower resolution um, but allows you to zoom out. So if I go to here, so now we're one level up in the pyramid and, um, sorry, so we go up one level and up one level, and up one level. So each step here, I'm taking four images, um, put together, they're, uh, they're 512 on a side, <clears throat> average that down to 256 by 256, and we zoom out, and zoom out, and zoom out. So this image is only 256 pixels on a side. This constitutes the top level of this quad tree pyramid. It's a very nice data structure for, um, manipulating images. <clears throat> we, 
in order to build this quad tree as quickly as possible, we restrict the amount of memory we're using at any given time so that we don't overwhelm, overwhelm the computer and cause thrashing. Um, we're <clears throat> we take regions of the picture one at a time and build this quad tree in a rather memory efficient manner um, so that um, what used to take sometimes an overnight stitch job, we're now, um, we now have down to uh, a matter of hours or a couple hours. So in March when we released Stitch 1.0, we were able to get a five times speed up, which I thought was pretty nice. Um, we're also able to show a preview image to the user um, after the first phase of stitching so that they can sort of get a preview of how the results look before the whole computation is done. Um, let me conclude by listing some of the people that worked on the software. Randy Sargent is really the principal author. I have became involved in Stitch only a year and a half, and a half ago, but there are a number of other people who have contributed to Stitch. Um, okay, thank you. So that was Paul Heckbert, and next up is Alexandre Jenny. He's the founder and CEO of Color, the world's reference in image stitching solutions. Its star product, Autopano, is sold worldwide. Paris 26 Gigapixels, the world's largest panoramic image ever, is a great example of the company's ingenuity. Alexandre holds a master's degree in material physics and worked for five years in the video game industry. So. Hi, so I'm Alexander Jenny. Uh, I thought the comment, yes, Paris uh, 26 gigapixel is not anymore the biggest panel you can see. Uh, there are some people uh, I just met uh, during this conference that did really much bigger than that. Uh, so who we are? Uh, we are the, the guy that did the Paris uh, 26 gigapixel. And we did that project because we wanted to show our, the possibilities of our, uh, uh, of our stitcher, in fact. And since that, uh, uh, we just list, listed some of the images uh, on there. Uh, currently, the world record is uh, Rio Janeiro 150, something like that. Uh, that's really beyond imagination. You cannot really think how, how, much, how big it is. So just a quick. Uh, fall back and I'll show you what it is a big image. So this is Paris, okay? Paris 26 gigapixel, only only 26, okay? <laughs> 26 is that big. Okay? One note about uh, this extreme panorama, I would say, is the quality you can, uh, uh, the sharpness you can achieve at this uh, kind of range. You are really at the limit of the optics. Uh, you can go beyond, but you have some fog that appears. You can heat wave uh, on, on some, uh, for example, here, heat wave. You can see that it's not really straight. Nevertheless, it's still really fun to play and use uh, such a, a big image quite in real time. There was a story be between, uh, that we didn't really accept with these uh, images. Some people discovered here on the top a gun. <laughs> a, a real gun, yeah, in Paris. Uh, we had trouble with the police then after that. But we are not responsible for garbage left on the Anyway, just to show what can be done. Uh, 2,346. Uh, exactly. Uh, 
one common point between all <coughs> these projects, all have been stitched with our, with, with our software, Autopano Giga. So what is Autopano Giga? Autopano Giga is a, is a product that has been uh, uh, under the market since five years now, and it's really the, all the best technology that you can have to build a stitch. First, one note, it, first a general stitcher. So you don't need to have the assumption uh, that you have a grid, uh, a grid kind of shooting. You can just throw a full folder of image in our software and it will detect the link automatically. We don't suppose any uh, kind of pattern in the shooting, okay, like a grid shooting. Here are some of the tags uh, uh, that we support. Uh, as a general stitcher, it's, uh, it has to have a manual mode. If it doesn't work in automatic mode, you have to have a manual mode. That's uh, the manual control point editor. Control point that uh, Paul showed us, you can edit it directly in Autopano, then optimize again to take into account that. We have something really nice, it's anti-ghost technology. What is really common when you have uh, uh, overlapping zones with moving object? <laughs> It doesn't correspond. So that is uh, some technique that we have. We have color, color correction. If you have fast moving cloud, the global illumination during the panorama will change. You need to correct for that. Uh, something that is new in the new version, multiple viewpoint. You can create panorama from several viewpoints. You don't need to, to, to be at the same viewpoint. That's especially efficient if you are doing some panorama of some sphere panorama from a balloon, from a, uh, we saw some helicopter uh, yesterday with the National Geographic. With that, with our system, you can do uh, such panorama after that. Motor race head support. We support the Gigapan. We really like the hardware. We also have our own hardware, which is a bit different. It's an open source hardware. I, can, I won't really talk much. Uh, if you want a demonstration about that, we will do uh, this evening. War support, etc. HDR. I will step uh, quickly to, into two, uh, two big problems. Anti ghost. Here's a 12 image panorama. Uh, I was following this uh, rider. He's riding a bike uh, while driving uh, in these stones. What our software does is automatically detect where there is motion and it will keep only some of the image, some of the bike to have a directly good panorama at the end. So for, on the 12 image, it decided to, to keep the background, and only on four image, it decided to keep the background and the bicycle. And everything is really nice looking panorama at the end. Uh, something I really care about, uh, Paul uh, said uh, he, he's working on the speed. We work on the speed since a long time already. And for example, our optimizer is a, a directly parallelized optimizer. We are partnering with Intel on that. So our really top, uh, top speed now. Here, some comparison, for example, between 2.0 version and 2.5, the multi-core uh, usage, we are far beyond the expectation of uh, our partner, Intel, that really pushes uh, into limits of the multi-core technology. So this is com something that has been validated with, with them and we are really proud of that. In each, in fact, in each of stage of the stitching, detection, optimization, one day, we are multi-core. And we are using a lot of that. Some other stuff that we, uh, that you are able to do in uh, your um, stitcher, neutralizer, that's a new technology that we came out. The haze, a common, a common problem in the panoramic photography <coughs> with this new technique that we developed, we are able to extract the depth of air for each pixel in an image and then to be able to remove that. This is before, after. <coughs> this is before, the image before, after you have that. And here I, I extracted the depth map so you can see the quality of the depth map that we are able to calculate to be able to remove exactly uh, the haze. We apply that on the ace, but it's possible to apply that to get a kind of 3D out of a flat image. Uh, gigapan stitching. Uh, gigapan <coughs> stitching is, in fact, 
a structured stitching. We suppose we have a grid, and because of that grid, we can guess some stuff uh, that are not easy to guess when you are in the general case. For example, how will I put a full blue image from the sky? If you are in a grid, you know that it's uh, probably near the neighbor, but you cannot guess that if you are in the general case. So we support that. That's uh, the, the import plugin for Gigapan here. It has been um, uh, improved for version 2.5 with some uh, new uh, techniques to prevent uh, pattern recognition. If you have pattern in the image, that's really common when you have buildings. Uh, one window is just the same as the windows that is just nearby. With that, we can prevent that, and the stitch is always great. We support that. We support uh, the different kind of, uh, of uh, displacement uh, of the head. Uh, uh, 360 degree, uh, full round. Uh, the last row will be glued to the first, uh, the last column to the first column. The second plugin is uh, another kind of uh, import plugin with structured plugin. You directly have a preview. It's for this head that is uh, another uh, panoramic head, motorized panoramic head. I will make a demo. If I get back my mouse. So this is the interface of Photopano. On the left, it's like a, a light table, a slide light table, where you put some image and you regroup them logically uh, before detection. So here I really have trouble with my mouse. Okay. Never mind. And uh, then you just decide, uh, okay, this is a panorama. Hit detection. This is a general case panorama. So I didn't use the, the Gigapan plugin. And you have the panorama directly in preview uh, on the left. This is a preview. This is not uh, the final uh, picture. You need to wonder it uh, afterwards. But we can al already see uh, where are the image and so on. You can change the projection. You can, uh, if the layout is not great, you can, uh, you can uh, adjust the horizon, uh, the vanishing point, and so on. Put verticals where uh, something that's really nice in the building, you have to have straight line. So you just use a tool here. We'll show you that. Let's detect another panorama. Something that is really nice, you want to have straight lines, so I just draw some straight line. where there are straight lines, obviously. Sorry. Hit enter, and it straight everything up. That's it. So we have color correction enabled. You can see it on this image if I disable that. Uh, in fact, it just modified a bit the sky because the sky was a bit uh, uh, less exposed than the ground. So, for the Gigapan import, it's in the import menu. Select Gigapan. And it's like in the Gigapan system, in fact. Select the image. Take a quick, quick example. Just click finish and it creates the panorama. It's on the group there, in the last group, and you have that uh, directly at the end. Of course, there are a lot of options. Okay, that's it. You have the panorama. You have a number here that is really nice that gives you the quality of the stitch, the, uh, what we call the RMS, the, the wrist may, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh, that is the, the less, the better. Uh, below the rule, it's uh, really perfect. <coughs> then wandering, wandering is, the, is the, the, the stage where you really create the, the image at the end. Several options, uh, anti-ghost is the option that enables the, the way to remove the ghost. Uh, you have exposure fusion. Exposure fusion is really nice. It's an option if you have bracketed series. It will keep the best exposure of each bracket. So you are able to get 
uh, a directly uh, tone map image at the end. Uh, HDR output is really if you want to produce HDR in radiance format uh, to, a, to be able to, to create, to create a CG, etc., etc. A lot of formats supported and so on. There's two new options uh, that is really nice. It's, we have stacking option. A stack is a notion that uh, we can say at each position how many images were shot. And then that in the software, you will get several panorama that will be layered. And you have several output that are perfectly aligned. With that, you can really think of new stuff like making gigapixels of stacked panorama without stacking the, the, the image before, but after that. Go back to my presentation. Some word about, uh, uh, about us. We are uh, specialized in panoramic photography, mostly uh, uh, the, it begins for the landscape photography. And, uh, in fact, um, we found out that to make big landscape photography, to be able to, to have all this research for science, etc., we need something that is really open and, uh, and efficient in, uh, in many areas. When the first Gigapan came out, we, we found it's a nice hardware, but we found out that why uh, such a small hardware because photographers really care about the big lenses, the big uh, DSLR and so on, they will have a better quality. And uh, that's why our community, not us, but our community of users on our forum, decided to create uh, this stuff. It's in fact the, the idea really simple. It's a standard uh, motorized head for telescopes that has been converted to be able to make a gigapixel image. That's it. And, uh, the conversion is really easy, it's just uh, that Bluetooth model that has been added uh, to be able to control from an open source software here. So that's the, one of our other products uh, beyond the stitchers, Color Pano Gear. It's an open source motorized head, so you have everything on our website. If you want to build it uh, yourself, you can. Uh, it's Papi Wizards uh, software that's also open source. Many people are working on that, they are making of course, gigapixel, but I saw some really nice presentation about time-lapse photography with motorized head. We also have other, uh, other product. A, a key point here, if you have a gigapixel, what are you going to do with that? For the moment, there is the gigapan.org uh, website, really nice website to show, to show something. But if you want to go beyond that, you need something that is able to convert your big image into something that can be put on a website. And that's Panotour. Uh, Color Panotour is a virtual tour software. The, the main purpose was more for real estate, but in fact, we added all the functionality to work in gigapixel image too. So it's the only so, uh, virtual tour software that support gigapixel. So you can, uh, what, uh, for example, the, the, I don't remember the name, but. The National Geographic guy showed us about the, the Egyptian um, uh, cave there. They, they make, uh, let's say, 30 minutes uh, to have this virtual visit. With our software, Partner Tools, two clicks, you import your image, you click on the zone. Here, I want this text to be displayed when I click here. You say export. In one minute, you have done this job. And you can do it on gigapixel. You can annotate gigapixel. You can make insertion of video in gigapixel. That is really nice to, to be able to build something together with, with, with gigapixel. Oh, I added uh, my slide question here. I will talk more about uh, this, uh, the two images here. Uh, to be able to show what is possible with uh, panoramic photography, each year we have a context, a photographic context of panorama, and it ended with a jury of international photographers that chose the 150 better photographs, and in a hard book 
of photography. I have the, the, this year uh, example are here, if you want to see it. It really shows what all the possibilities of uh, general photography or gigapan is possible uh, in this area when you think of stitching. I am good in time? I have one more minute, so I have one more image. <laughs> <laughs> so don't hesitate to contact me at any time. You have my email here. Uh, I will talk uh, a little about uh, this image and another image. Uh, it's uh, really common to use now stitching techniques for astrono astronomical photography. Uh, there, there were last year a really big image of the Milky Way quite one gigapixel in size. It has been print made by, uh, by a famous French photographer, Serge Brunier. It has been printed uh, 12 uh, meter in length, 6 meter in high, and displayed in Monaco. Really, really a nice picture to look at, and it was made up of 2,200 uh, images, not 2,000. Thank you for your attention. So our final speaker, um, we're going to run over a little bit, uh, sorry about that, but our, our final speaker is Gene Cooper. He's an interactive technologies artist exploring relationships between the natural systems of the body and ecology. Cooper is currently the owner of Four Chambers Studio, where his work includes development of new photographic technologies, interactive exhibits for science centers, panoramic virtual tour products of national parks, interactive installations, and performances. So here's Jean. I'll try to. Uh, is there a way to try from the screen? Or no? um, That's okay. It would take a minute. Okay. Well, thank you, um, and thanks for having me out here. The uh, so you know with computers and technology and everything, you know, so the very nice little little presentation I Sorry. brought Just with me talking. didn't translate quite right, so and didn't make it on the plane with me, so. Uh, so I'm going to wing it a little bit, but I'm going to wanted to mix it up a little bit anyway. So let me get a. I uh, wanted to start with one of the more um, give a little bit more of the history of some of the different stitching evolution that has, that has happened over the years, and kind of talk about how it was done before that and so forth. So uh, how many of you have? I and I have a I have a guess, and I wanted to see if my estimates are even close. Um, so I'm going to guess that the answer to this next question is maybe half the people in the room. So uh, how many people have heard of QuickTime VR? Okay, so it's a little bit off. Looks like more like 80% or so. How many people, now I'm going to guess the other answer to the question is maybe uh, 25%. How many people have used QuickTime VR? Okay, I'm a little bit closer on that one. So, so uh, QuickTime VR was probably one of the earliest, uh, more commercially available stitching softwares. And I'm not going to go into it too much in detail, um, only to say that, to, to give it a little recognition for that as kind of more of the early adopter of trying to make it possible to digitally stitch images together and present them you know, in a format that people can play back on their computers. So it was one of the earlier, more commercialized versions. And then there's a number of other developers and scientists and so forth who had been doing a lot more um, so, sort of calculations and work on their own for scientific purposes. Um, one person in particular was Helmut Dirsch, who, I'll see if I can get to my tabs here, who is uh, with Pano Tools. So Professor Dirsch uh, is responsible for a lot of the post um, the next stage of development after QuickTime VR and in terms of, okay, Apple didn't really continue its development of that um, and they didn't, you know, keep overseeing that and developing it and evolving it, but folks like Professor Dirsch and a number of other people and uh, people like Alexander and Paul, you know, have sort of stepped in and filled those shoes of giving the public you know, some more tools to work with, and in fact, much better tools now to work with than, than, than what we first saw with um, QuickTime VR. So the main differences with QuickTime VR to start with were 
um, and I wish I had a few examples to show you, but the main examples were that it started out you could stitch a single row of panoramas, uh, I'm sorry, a single row of images, and that was really great. And for a long time that was the, that was the main model. Then it began to say, oh, we can stitch multiple rows of panoramas, I'm um, sorry, multiple rows of images, and then start to assemble them and a little bit taller. And then finally, you know, gets into the full 360 realm, which is more thought of as cubic panoramas. And so, uh, and then we kind of lead up to today where we're not just making cubic panoramas, but we're making gigapixel cubic panoramas and gigapixel uh, narrow field panoramas and so forth. So, so it's really quite an evolution and uh, it's quite an interesting development. So let me back up a little bit here. So I want to talk about this photo right here because it's, personally it's kind of uh, an image that sort of uh, kind of rang a bell for me a little bit in terms of where we are today and what was done in the past. So this image is uh, a 1906 earth, uh, picture of the earthquake in San, San Francisco. And I saw this in person at the, 19, uh, the 2006 retrospective of the earthquake, you know, at SF MoMA and so forth. So I saw this on the wall. In fact, it was actually not much smaller than this. It was about this big. And uh, so it was not too much smaller than that. And it was a plate glass negative. And I thought, wow, that's really amazing. That's, that's a big negative and for people that have darkroom experience before and so forth. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then, the, uh, then it dawned on me that this is taken from the air. And I'm like, wow. Well, wait a minute. How do they take that from the air? So, so what I researched and found out, this is uh, photographed by a gentleman named George Lawrence who pioneered a way to take aerial panoramas from, from the sky. And it's not through balloons. It's not through you know, anything else that was available then. It was through kites. It was a very simple technology. He strang 15, I'm sorry, there were about 13 six-foot box kites together in a line, had a 40-pound camera, <laughs> sent it up, up to uh, 1,500 feet in the air, and shot a number of pictures in the early, uh, in, in the early century um, that are just amazing. And I bring this up in a case in point where it's so great to go back and look at the book that Ela was presenting to the, uh, uh, some of the other uh, presenters and so forth and, and look at that because it kind of represents like, let's not forget about this other early work. It's really important, really helpful, and shows a lot of the engineering and thoughtfulness and innovation that goes into things. And so I think that's representative of what we're seeing here today where some simple ideas can come together. It uh, doesn't need to be super high tech all the time. It can be low tech and so forth, and then you have some amazing images. So case in point, nobody's able, been able to recreate this photo um, in, the same, in the same technology. So there are some things that are, that are quite interesting. And then I'll wrap up with uh, maybe one or two more uh, uh, notes. <coughs> yeah, OK. So I'll put up a list later or something like that and email it out to people. But thank you very much. <laughs>